click a few buttons. Um, it all gets edited anyway, so uh, don't worry if you make any mistakes or anything like that. Um, one thing we didn't really discuss is um, Veterans Vault. So that's kind of, um, you know, the part of the show that's tailored around our guests, sort of area of expertise. Obviously, you guys um, could probably nut out on spearfishing gear all day long. Um, but what would you like to talk about? Sort of, it'll be a 15 minute show where we could just do, you know, or, or you know, just general Q and A about one particular you, you know, subject. Yeah, gear, anything shop related, gear related. And uh, I mean, Joe is an you know, amazing free dive instructor too. So as far as training, um, uh, that, that could be a good topic too. Yeah, and, and, and just I, to give you an idea, my nine to five, I've been a, a, a lifeguard uh, since I started spearfishing. They almost happened on the same day. Um, I've worked in Florida, New Jersey, um, Australia for a short period of time. I had a, a, um, a eight month contract at the Northern beaches of Sydney. So um, if there's anything I can take from my experience from spearfishing and from being on a beach is um, playing it safe. You know, I have no problem touching on safety uh, again and again and again from, you know, always diving with a buddy, tip protectors, being aware of a propeller. Um, I've just seen so much tragedy on the water, you know, right. so, so, yeah. All right, well, let's just play it by ear. And um, okay. I, I think safety will come out in the interview anyway, and it quite often comes out in the form of stories and stuff, and then we can sort of do a bit more of a deep dive into particular areas. For veterans, well, I think we'll go with um, maybe equipment um, okay. spe specific to your guys' part of the world, because I think the safety stuff, it's better if it sort of comes out organically around stories rather than like, oh, these guys are doing a veteran's fault on safety. Everyone's like, right, yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, true. Like, um, I'm not saying that it won't be great, great information, but it's kind of like, I like to sort of sneak the safety in there and, and sort of ninja the guys with safety rather than, um, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, Club on the head with it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, but cool. All right. Um, okay. I think I'm ready to go. I'll just, uh, I might get, can, can I get you guys to record your end of the podcast and I'll just have to do something in order for you guys to do that. But that'll, See that'll it. give me the best, the best, um, the best possible, um, audio quality. Okay. So you, you should be able to see a record button down the bottom of the screen there. Yeah. Just punch that. Should, yeah. There we go. Sweet. Ass. All right. All right. Sorry about my, my Aussie Kiwi slang. Uh, we'll, we'll get we'll get through it. <laughs> <laughs> Say what? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, good. Here we go. Um, well, welcome to the, the Noob Square podcast today. I've got Mike and Joe from Benthic Ocean Sports. G'day, fellas. How are you? Hey. I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. It's 8 a.m. here. What, what about in your part of the world? What, what time are we dealing with? Oh, 5 p.m. on Cinco de Mayo, and we're starting to celebrate a little early, man. Hope you don't mind. No, all good, man. Um, brews go good with podcasting, I find. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you guys look busy there. You're in the shop. Someone, John's working there on, on equipment. Have you guys had a busy day preparing for Cinco de Mayo? This is, this is actually Benthic's first day of normal operating hours post, uh, like, COVID, COVID closure that we had ah, to go through. Nice. Yeah. Nice. And um, you got Groper season there just opened up? Amberjack. Amberjack season. Okay. Yeah, Amberjack just opened this last weekend. Um, so that's that, That's a big one around here for us. Yeah. Next big one that opens for us will be Red Snap. You guys seem to get, like, a lot of Amberjack, like, big, big Amberjacks in, in big numbers as well. Is that just every year like that? Great area of the world. Hmm um yeah yeah and it you know it seems to be getting a little better and better doesn't it yeah i think what's happened is um we've, we've seen some government step in and do some closures and some uh, more regulation on that particular species and uh we're just reaping the, the benefits <laughs> yeah. so we have a, a short season um you know it's only four months of the year it's mm -hmm. a one fish per person limit but uh if you're selective with that fish and you take your time um you can get fish uh, we've got one uh, one of our friends shot one 131 pounds so that's you know 60 kilo it's a good one yeah it's a good one that's enough that's enough fish for a few weeks it'll, or it'll, feed it'll the yeah. neighborhood. <laughs> good stuff 
Um, yeah, oh. massive amberjack. I see. I've seen Instagram like over recent days, sort of start coming up with all the AJs shot over there. So that's pretty cool. And a few of the few of the dudes in my community have taken a few as well. I don't think anything over fifty pounds or sixty pounds yet, but um, some special fish regardless. What about you guys? Um, let's go with Mike. Um, how did you start spearing, Mike? What's your background? You you're a military man. Um, yeah, you know, I ended up in the military. I actually grew up down in, down in the Keys originally as a little kid. So, uh, family had a marina down in Isla Mirada and, um, you know, I was just that little sunburnt barefoot dock rat running around the docks, you know, jumping in the water, grabbing a lobster around the docks, things like that. So, um, yeah, it was always grew up around the water. Uh, the military kind of took me away from it. And then mm. post-military, this, uh, you know, it's what brought me to this, this region. And, um, man, I just, just came back, came roaring back. I just, you know, I didn't realize how much I missed it. Mm -mm, I can relate. I had about um, 18 months away and man, I just realized I always want to be living near the ocean and on the ocean if I, I can help it. And um, the yeah. Keys is a special area of the world. I, I recently read, or um, well, I'm still reading actually, Art Pinder, the Art Pinder book, The King of Sling. I think Cherie Day wrote it. And um, so it's cool to learn a little bit about the area and the development of the area and sort of the history of spearfishing in that area. So. Um, I'm kind of intrigued at the moment. Florida's definitely on my hit list, so that's pretty cool. What about you, um, Joe? I actually started in uh, on the mid '90s. Uh, I think it was 1995 uh, on the Jersey Shore, Jersey Coast, just outside of really New York City. I know that's crazy to think about. Um, my my profession. I started a uh, seasonal lifeguard, uh, yep. and the, probably within the first three or four days of being a lifeguard on the beach, I was spearfishing. Yeah, wicked. And um, so what you're targeting up there, like um, striped bass and tortog? That's, you, you hit both the species that we would, we would um, um, see in about one foot visibility. Those were the two <laughs> fish that were most, <laughs> you most got that, sought after. You got that block island fishery off there though, don't you? Yeah, yeah. You, yes, the East Coast fishery up there. Um, actually, the striped bass when I was a kid growing up had, um, was uh, way overfished. They had moratoriums and things like that. But by the time the nineties came around the, 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 you could shoot 30 and 40 pound fish, Yeah, um, three fish limit. Yeah. It was amazing. We got a day yeah. for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Cool, man. Um, so did you do, um, spear like Rhode Island as well when you were sort of up there? You know, I didn't travel much. We kind of just, you know, back then being a lifeguard and not having much money in your pocket, you just kind of rode your bicycle to the public <laughs> beach entrance. <laughs> Hope to hope you could see your hand in front of your face, kicked out to the end of the jetty rocks and you just shot what was there. Yeah. And so your sort of passion for the water has very much gone sort of a, 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 you know, a very interesting route. It sounds like you started off lifeguarding and then you, you've moved into, into freediving. You, you, you've spent time in Australia as well. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, actually in 1999, um, I was doing the whole, you know, uh, uh, sales shirt and tie kind of thing. Um, really didn't last too long. And um, where I was working in, in New Jersey, they had a lifeguard exchange program between Sydney, Australia, or Australia and, um, and New Jersey. And mm. uh, obviously, you know, there's more talent with lifeguards in Australia than there is in New Jersey. Um, but I trained up real hard and I got an eight month contract working in northern beaches of Sydney. Um, it's something near and dear to my heart. Um, in in mm. fact, now I'm a lifeguard chief and um, I've, I've started H2B exchange visa. And wow. uh, I probably hire anywhere from 10 to 20 Australian lifeguards a year. So Jesus, the, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. The exchange program's going strong. And uh, the, the water's pretty cool up there. Um, Jersey, like um, coming to the Northern beaches, you would have felt spoiled. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> that's a good way to yeah, put it. Is spoiled. It is. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. dive in five mils up there in New Jersey till about the 4th of July. Yeah. And the girls, the girls aren't in their bikinis in Jersey. Nah, nah, <laughs> nah. <laughs> I can see the attraction of the northern beaches for sure. And um, so what about Spear? And when did that all start for you? And how did that start? Yeah, no, the, literally the first, almost the first day I started sitting on the beach, my supervisor, I grew up bow hunting deer and bass fishing. Mm. And um, my lifeguard supervisor, Jeff Carpenter, um, jumped in, a, 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 took a little swim around the rocks and he had a catch bag and a pole spear, of which I knew neither what they were at the time. And he popped out the other side of the jetty about an hour later and, and the bag was full of tall tog. And, uh, and I, my brain was just like, boom, like what just happened? You know, this guy's combining some sort of bow hunting and fishing thing together and he's going underwater. Hmm. Uh, he came around a few, few days later and we just, I just started peppering him with questions. 
Mm. Uh, and when you know it, like a day later, I was in the water with him and I shot my first fish. And it's mm. been a, it's been a, 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 a success story, I guess you could say, ever since. Mm. For both of you guys, it sounds like the, the hunter orientation towards the ocean was there from the get-go. Like, uh, Mike, you were in the water getting, getting lobster. Joe's the same. He's, he was, saw the bag of tortog. It was like the, the addiction was there. Some people, it's like when they start talking about the water, it's all about the, the serenity and, you know, looking at stuff. And you can tell that they're probably going to be a, a scuba diver forever. But um, there's, a, there's a particular bent of freediver spearfishermen. I think it's there from the start. It sounds like you yeah. guys had it, had it in spades. Um, what about yeah, early no, on? It's a good way to put it. I like looking at some of the micro life on reef, and I appreciate that. But, yeah. you know, I'm, yeah. you know I, I, I'm in the water to uh, harvest fish. It's funny you said that, too. It's funny you said that, too, because uh, with my lifeguarding background, um, uh, other than, like, the – the clubby boards, like the mouths, the rescue boards, I can certainly handle myself in the surf on them right away, but I could never imagine myself taking time out of the day to go catch a wave. Um, mm. Anytime I'm in the water, I want to know what's behind that rock and I want to go and chase it, kill it, gather it, grab it. Like, yeah, that's my, that's my passion is, is the hunting portion for sure. Yeah. I always felt more um, paranoid about sharks and stuff on a, on a boogie board out the back of a surf lineup than I ever have spearfishing. Um, Cause at least, you know, we've got our faces in the water. Some of the spots around too, pretty sketchy. I, I'd definitely rather be face down in the water than on a board. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I agree. Yeah. 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 I've, never, agree. I've never ridden a board. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I did boogie boarding when I was younger. The part of New Zealand where I grew up, like the, that part of the coastline is pretty famous for some good waves, but the water's filthy. So I don't know how I ended up spearing, but you know, it was like looking in, probably a bit like Jersey, you know, water's cold, yeah. dirty. But um, you know, like it, you know, you can spare if you if you if you are pa par um, passionate enough, then you'll find a way to do it. So that's pretty cool. Um, early obstacles for you guys. Um, did you both have issues with different things, or was it similar? Similar. Uh, yeah. For, well, for me, obstacles really were coming. You know, getting um, locally in this area. You know, when I when I got out of the military and I and I first moved here was. Um, it was, it was just finding people, finding dive buddies. Yeah. Yeah. More than anything. It was just, mm. um, and, and that, you know, um, that, you know, that all changed when, um, actually whenever you know, I met Joe and met some other buddies that finally, you know, were, you know, want, wanted to hold their breath and go shoot some fish. Um, mm -hmm. everybody else around this area is, it's always been a scuba dominant culture. And, um, yeah, yeah. you know, you know, that's, you know, good, good for them. You know, all, that's great, but you know, just not, not what I've always wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. I came from a scuba diving background. I like I did my I went through the Paddy Master Scuba Diver Instructor when I was young, and um, but when it, whenever I, like I remember just getting out there without any of that stuff on with a Hawaiian sling and shooting a couple of butterfish, and you know like I was just like, oh, this feels free, and I don't think I need all the stuff to you know shoot 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 fish. So you know, but each to their own. Like I, I think scuba diving, scuba diving spearfishing is probably definitely uh, reasonable in some parts of the world, like especially cold, deep, dark water waters. Um, uh, but yeah, like, um, I, I, I prefer the free dog, so I get where you're coming from. Did you, um, so how did you build a crew? So you just found one or two guys and then a, you, you access their network or, or did you find a group? Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. Very, very small little groups of people. And, um, you know, really our, our area here really started to open up whenever, you know, actually whenever Joe started teaching free diving classes in our region, you know, that's, that's really what, um, really what would expose a lot of people for the first time in their whole lives because everybody here just thought if you're if you're gonna go shoot fish out here you know 70 80 feet you know you have you have to scoop it up you know, it was mm. unheard of you know really there was only a real small handful of people free dive spear fishing mm, mm. and then um so yeah, getting people in the classes and building that confidence and um we just you know just grown exponentially cool well tell us a little bit about the benthic story how long have um so you got a shop there. Where where is it? And um and, and, and what do you guys how long has that been running? We're uh in Destin, Florida. Um mm. probably is this is the start of the seventh season of Benthic. It's pretty that's pretty mind blowing. That's <laughs> that's hard to process. Yeah, yeah. So it was just um, you know, I left my, my last job. I I couldn't, you know, I just knew I had to do something different. I left mm. and you know, I had this idea. I wanted, you know, I realized it was, there was, there was nothing like this, you know, for this community here. Um, mm. Something that, you know, I wanted. 
Um, so called Joe up, had met Joe before, you know, and call him up, have some beers, uh, you know, to <laughs> bounce the idea off him to see if, see if, uh, see what he thought, see what his, um, see if he, if he had any ideas of brands and gear to, you know, to carry in the store and things like that. And, uh, mm. you know, yeah, that's, that's where it grew from. So what does Benthic mean? Where did the name come from? Uh, Benthic is, is the bottom or the mm. deepest layer of any body of water. Mm. Okay. A marine classification zone, like pelagic, benthic. Like, ben, oh, like, like benthos, but the... the, the yeah, the benthic is the bottom, the right. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, okay, cool. So, okay, that's an interesting name. How did you guys come up with that? Just um, So, when you're trying to figure out... Uh, <laughs> when you're trying to um, find a business name, ocean mm. or diving related, in the mm. state of Florida that isn't already taken... You don't have many options. It was, it was it was at the very bottom of the list. <laughs> you're going through a bunch of technical terms. You're like, oh, that, that'll do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> and um, and what about you? So, Joe, how did you? So, you got involved from the get go, like around around some beers, by the sounds of the Benthic story. Yeah, and I, I started teaching maybe only a a, a season before Mike decided to um, open the shop. Um, mm. I started doing the formal education um, simply simply because from my, my line of work, I could see where if you had a, a lot of interest in the sport and if younger kids and stuff like that were, um, God forbid, dying or getting hurt, that's, mm. how, that's how people come in and make rules and say, you know, no holding your breath, no spearfishing, mm. don't spearfish mm. by dogs, don't do this. And I just thought of being part of the solution as opposed to the problem. Um, yeah. And who, who knew it would catch on to where now, yeah, we've got – there's many, there's many people interested in the sport. You know, when I started, it was really just a niche sport. And now um, it's, it's still a niche sport, but I mean, I'm just absolutely shocked at the popularity. Mm. So do you guys um, actively evangelize um, some of the scuba spheros and try and sort of show them the, the path of the Jedi? Uh, <laughs> I think it's, I think it's, it's, it's a natural transition. Yeah, I think, yeah, I I think those guys come in and I, I think as they, maybe as they mature, they just start to, they want to get rid of the tanks eventually. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's yeah. funny. I, yeah. I, I just remind them there's no world records for scuba. There's only world records. For yeah. Free <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you sell them the old records ticket. Eh? It, it, it appeals to a few, but. I don't know, like competitions and, and, and records are they're kind of like a, they are, they do appeal to a, a, definitely a group of, of Spiros, but I don't know that it, there's this mass appeal. A lot of people just seem to want to shoot their dinner and have some fun and, you know, replenish yeah. their soul, so to speak. Um, the competitive drive doesn't even sort of register, I think, for some people. But um, what about, what with your well, no, and, and yeah, and I was just speaking to the fact that they don't even that it's so so not um, spearfishing on scuba. I, I've sort of noticed in other parts of the world, it's it's illegal and highly frowned upon. You know, mm. so 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 that's where I was going with that. Is we're one of I think only a handful of countries, if not certainly one of the largest countries that still allows legally for people to spearfish on scuba. So by no means am I trying to throw rocks at those folks, but from a nah, nah. from a global situation, you know, from a world situation. Um, man, you wouldn't think to do that where you're sitting, Australia, New Zealand, to, to shoot fish on scuba in some places. It would just be uh, frowned upon or illegal, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. A, lot of the, a lot of those guys want to travel, too. Those divers want to travel and spearfish, mm. and they start to realize, dang, I can't, I, mm. I can't do that and, You know where I'm going, you know, where mm. I'm traveling to. So I've, I've got to learn how to hold my breath. And make well, that I can relate to what you guys are saying. Like, I think it's a natural progression too. And, and maybe scuba diving is the gateway drug to the free day, free diving world, you know, but um, how, how, can you, can you assist someone with that transition? And, and when you do, what are the kind of the obstacles that you see um, with guys that have gone from tanks to, to, to breath hold? Yeah, we do it all the time. I mean, it's, it's pretty common. We've got a, we've got a lot of guys that come in and, um, it's um the obstacle I think is a it might be I don't know what would you say Joe? I, like I would say breaking bad habits yeah. um if they have a little <laughs> bit of history of doing some breath hold yeah. and then just some of it is the expectation some of the folks that are coming from a scuba background um you know, they're they're I think they're expecting to go through a a, a one day or maybe a two day course. 
mm. and all of a sudden be, you know, having four minute breath holds and, mm. and, and mm. shooting fish at 30 meters and things like that. Um, while mm. certainly we provide the cookbook for that, mm. there is a little bit of practice that needs to be taken to get mm. there. So the expectation, yeah. you know, um, and, and nothing again against the scuba dive, but it's a little bit of more of an instant gratification type world. You know, you get mm. your certification card, the next thing you know, you're hanging out, breathing compressed air yeah. at six Get, feet. Getting them to realize that they have to train. You know, yeah, that they, just yeah, practice. Yeah. Practice yeah. is a better word. Yeah, practice, practice. I actually, um, so I actually met uh, a lot of my dive buddies in a free dive um, pool training group here. And the, the training was run specifically for, for, sp for spearfishers. And um, it was an eight week program run by a really experienced guy named Wayne Judge. And I, I, met, I met a whole crew of guys that I considered my dive buddies hardcore for a few years. And um, that was a really, powerful way to improve your free diving but also meet a, a whole bunch of divers do you guys run any um regular um sort of training programs yes yeah. we do in the winter we do it in winter uh, we do it when most of our species are closed mm. um we've run a 12-week training session before and then we also um that, that's very formal um mm. we what we're trying to do is get uh, guys and girls in the pool um, build on on what experiences they have and so that hopefully by this time of year usually by may we finish it's february through may mm. um they're right out in the water and they don't have that 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 curve to get back into the swing of things you know they're jumping right off the boat into a warm-up doing 20 and 25 meter dives instead of you know knocking the rust off and then we do it informally as well just the local free dive community even though we are a shop and um you know we'll just get the, the local vagabonds together split the pool lane for a fee and and and, and just just train together um yeah. a little bit less info that's, uh, more that's, that's, been, that's been hard to do this season though <laughs> <laughs> yeah with uh, coronavirus yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. No pools yeah. closed everything like that yeah, yeah it's been tough yeah it's funny how um how how offended people get when you just pretend to cough too these days it's great for um mm. you know people keep complaining on social media like <laughs> they're not they're not obeying social distancing rules it's like just start coughing everyone obeys them yeah oh, yeah my, my buddy started coughing last night uh the, the, yeah last night was the first night restaurants were allowed to be open again in our <laughs> area. We, we met a couple out and my buddy just started packing and he couldn't it was his allergies he started coughing in the restaurant mm. i was like oh man <laughs> everything was silent <laughs> everything was silent. I, I actually started uh, with the toilet paper shortage oh. i just stopped wiping my ass and you'd be surprised how socially distant <laughs> people <can. laughs> Love it. That's a great technique. You can have, that's a one way to, you've read that book, how to win friends and influence people, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what about you guys? Um, you, you both obviously love spearing. Um, let's go with Joe. What's your favorite species to hunt and um, how do you hunt them effectively? Uh, my favorite species um, locally, I'm trying to keep it local as much as I can for sure is grouper. Um, mm -hmm. The reason being is um, here in where we're at in the northern Gulf of Mexico, grouper is for sure a bottom fish. So nobody can accidentally stumble across one with their snorkel still above the water. <laughs> you know, you got to kind of make the dive to get them. They're a bit more wary. Yeah. And my favorite is big breather, deep dive, and espeto, just putting the, my big old belly on the bottom and just resting, mm. looking out into the murk, and uh, hopefully uh, he or she swims up. Mm. Yeah, nice. Okay. And so there are fish that come to you once you've hit the bottom. You, you hope so. You know, you hope so. I mean, here we have a lot of public wrecks. Um, what by public, I mean their GPS coordinate numbers are for anyone to find on the internet. So the fish get a bit worried to the anchor, to the scuba bubbles, to someone fishing for them with traditional rod and reel. Mm. So, um, you know, the stealthy approach on the way down and just being very, very patient on the bottom. Um, I've taken some of my best grouper from um, one of the most publicly scuba dove recreational um, shipwrecks that we have. Mm. Um, simply by utilizing that technique by a very stealthy, stealthy approach, you know, um, going as slow as you possibly can just to do a 15 meter dive and spending as much time as, uh, you know, obviously safe and comfortable on the bottom and not mm. making a, not moving a muscle, you know, not even blinking my eyes, I don't think. And, and, uh, and what do you, so what do you think the response is from the grouper? Is it a territorial response that's, that's coming out to defend its little, little um, bit of area or is it a curiosity? Or is it maybe a mix I, for it? sure curiosity? I don't think they see anything because you know it's a lot of scuba folks on tourists, uh, tourists on scuba, mm. and a lot of recreational fishermen use that wreck that probably don't fish that much. You know, the, 
the better fishermen don't utilize it. So they see the, you know, the, the big lead sinker flying up and stuff like that mm. through the water column. Um, and I just don't think they get to see anything in their world as natural because all the boat visitors and stuff are just um, kind of kooky, you know, it's just mm. that particular wreck draws them. It's the closest one to the, to our, to our inlet, our pass, our, 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 our um, so yeah. So they see some, some kooky folks and if you can just settle in, they seem to respond. So 50 foot's pretty intimidating depth for people that are sort of, you know, in their first maybe six months of spear, or, or sorry, it can last even longer than that. But, you know, like uh, people that are, you know, haven't grown up breath hole diving, 15, 15 meters or 50 feet's pretty intimidating, especially when you want to lay on the bottom and, and spend a little bit of time there. Um, when guys come into the shop and they're asking you, besides trying to sell them the course, um, how do you give, sort of coach them through developing the confidence and maybe the ability to relax enough to be able to do those sorts of dives. Well, so that's funny that you say that. Um, some of our biggest amberjack have been taken. Um, technically, I don't know if we're spearfishing. I think sometimes our snorkels are out of the water. <laughs> we're shooting. We, we're shooting. I think we utilize some techniques to, um, you know, not every, even though the water there is, the bottom is sometimes 40, 50, 60. Like we've even done it at 70 meters, 230, 240 yeah. feet. Mm. We're not going down 240 feet. We, we try and just uh, explain to them that we have some tricks, bring those bigger fish up to the surface. So, yeah, the mm. grouper is just one particular species. Mm. Mm. Uh, we, sh we sure do our, our share of uh, subsurface yeah. uh, uh, shooting here where we have to technically roll our head to get the snorkel underwater so it counts yeah, as a yeah. Gr Grouper is <laughs> not where we start on in our area. At least. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But, um, but, but how, how, would you, how do you coach someone to um, start replicating some of those grouper hunting techniques? Uh, you know, John actually is working on spear guns behind us. He does a great job. He takes people on inshore guided spear fishing trips, and that, yeah, right that kind of helps get people just exposed to it. You know, get you know, holding the gun, loading a gun, making a dive. You know, they you know they might have to make you know the deepest dive inshore might be what's it twenty thirty feet something like that. So it's mm -hmm. it's it's great, great to just grease the wheels a little. Bit. Yeah, for sure. And having having someone um, guide you along the way and just model some of the, you know, good body language and, and you know, basic duck diving and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. It's huge. And, and there's a there's a pretty good community of those inshore divers around here now too. So it's, um you know, a lot of those guys are all looking for dive buddies. So that's what we try to do is we'll try to connect them with other guys that are diving inshore. That's a great, mm. great comfortable exposure to it. Mm. But boat diving's kind of where it's at with, with you guys. If you can get access oh, to yeah. a boat and get offshore, but it, it opens up the world a, a hell of a lot. Um, oh yeah. So, how do guys find boats in your area and 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 meet a crew apart from maybe doing the free dive training that you guys organise? Um, you know, I, I guess social media has played a you know crucial role in that. You know, the Facebook groups. Um, you know, we 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 started a a local free dive spearfishing club. You know, in our in our region, that's done a lot. That's that's gotten you know um, some good interest and gotten a lot of good divers together. What's the club called? And a lot of times we get a lot of people coming in and they're getting interested in the sport already together. You know, you'll have, you know, buddies that'll come in and want to take the class together. They're already have, they have their, their dive buddy built in they're they're training with. Hmm. What's the, what's the name of the club in the area? Uh, Agua Verdes. Ah, yeah. Okay. I've got it listed on the website. Actually, I know a few of the members in there, so that's pretty cool. Um, awesome. Uh, what about, what about you, Mike? Um, favorite species to hunt? Um, I, that's a hard one up here. I, I don't know. I'd probably just have to go with, um, I'd probably have to go with our red snapper. Yeah. You know, they're, 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 they're so plentiful. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a multi fish limit a day, you know, so you get some shooting in, um, you know, sometimes you got to knock out a deep dive for them. Sometimes you only got to make a 30, 40 foot dive for them. They can, um, they're just, uh, they're great eating fish. Um, and, uh, they look pretty. Yeah, they're, they're, they're beautiful. <laughs> they eat good. Like, you know, there's a, it's a good target. You know, there's plenty of them. So I, I, I have a fun time here in snapper season. And, and, it's in, and it's a warm season, too. It's okay. nice and toasty. Yeah, I can put on my little 1.5 mil suit. 1.5. I can dive, comfort I can dive yeah. comfortably. You know, it's a – yeah, I so, can't. I, so the red snapper, are they like a little version of a Cubera? Kind of the same. They would look more like your um, red emperor. Red, red, is yeah. it red emperor? Oh, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Almost identical looking, really. Okay. Um, yeah. All right, cool. 
And are they uh, spooky? It can be. It can be. So, um, you know, a lot of times they'll, they'll, they'll be on these large shipwrecks, you know, um, towards the beginning of the season. And they get the, the same pressure Joe is describing with grouper. You know, they, they get, you know, they see every anchor or every anchor, every lead weight, every scuba diver, you know, and they get, they get kind of pushed off. So they get kind of, they get real wary on those spots and they get pushed off to some of these smaller reefs and uh, little smaller private, you know, private spots that people mm -hmm. have. And um, so, so yeah, they're, they're wary. You, sometimes you have to work them. Other times they're, you know, they're hiding in a hole and it's literally shooting fish in a barrel. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds terrible, but. It sounds yeah, very you know. terrible. It sounds yeah. safe, selective and sustainable though. Yes, it, <laughs> it is. <laughs> No, nah, I think spearfishing's got a mix. Sometimes it's like you can do an incredible stalk and a really good breath hold and, 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 and shoot what's not even really a trophy fish at the end of that dive or whatever. And then other times you shoot really amazing fish and you, you didn't really work for it. At You've all. done nothing. It just swam right up to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's, and that, that is Red Snapper. You, know, you, know, you never know where they're going to be. It's, um, they're, they're a good time. Mm -mm. Cool. All right. What about tough situations out on the ocean? Uh, have you guys had your fair share of near misses? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, it's funny uh, that this this uh, first time I ever really dove in blue water was in Fiji, and um, there was just a local Fijian man that always went to surf on the on Frigates Pass, and one of the the boat uh, uh, deckhands was my dive buddy. Um, his English wasn't the best. He was my dive buddy. Uh, made one dive. He looked for a lobster. I went down to shoot a narrow bar Spanish mackerel that was, you know, attracted by the, the attention that he was creating. Mm -hmm. um, next thing you know, I'm alone in Fiji in the pass. And um, I thought, well, I'll just keep on spearing fish. Eventually someone comes to look for me. <laughs> uh, got really, really sharky. I got really, really late in the day. Um, mm -hmm. I had a plan in my head, which is just, you know, swim over to the reef and just try and hop up on the reef and spend the night. Eventually someone comes look for you, but um, you know, the surfers come and they grab me up and, uh, yeah, it was pretty scary, you know, first time in blue water. And I really thought for, for a moment there I was going to spend the night on the reef. Mm. Jeepers. So yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> so you, you were in current and your, um, and your boat's just kind of um, they just you. Yeah, they just disappeared on me. I guess that's mm. kind of the Fijian way. You know, they're really on island time over there. Mm. And, uh, yeah, we, you were, we, we eventually run in. You weren't hitting on the skipper's girlfriend or something, were you? <laughs> no, no, no. Just making, just making sure, man. <laughs> All that time in the northern beaches is, mate. You know, it's, it's giving you some bad habits, maybe. <laughs> yeah, well, I was a bit of a perv then. I'm a happily married man. Now. <laughs> yeah, good on you, man. Um, what about you, uh, Mike? Oh, sketchiest situation. Oh, you know, probably breaking all the rules. You know that you that you know where you're. You know, when you. Uh, Starting out, you everybody knows you you leave somebody on the boat normally, mm. and you know my bike. One time, I had a couple buddies. They talked me into it. They're like, "Oh, we'll just we'll anchor it really good. You know, we'll go down and we'll check the anchor." Mm. Talk me into it. And I was like, "Yeah, okay." And I got in the water, and after a little while, a storm came up and anchor pulled, and um, oh, we had geez. to swim like madmen to catch the thing. So yeah, that, that, that could have gone real bad. We were you know twenty five miles offshore, yeah, in a storm. <laughs> chasing a boat down. <laughs> what, 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 what were your takeaways from that situation for anchoring boats and some rules of thumb, so to speak? Uh, just, yeah, don't do anything stupid like that again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, I mean you, you, you know, you, you, you know, I, I mean, you know better than that. And um, mm. just to, you know, I mean, just any, any good day on the water can turn, you know, turn bad. It can tr turn tragic so fast. Mm. You just got to respect it. There, there are a few things you can do if you want to anchor and everyone jumps off. I mean, I've done it sort of okay a few times. If you've got a little bit of current, I think the rules are you've, everyone's got to swim up current of the boat rather than going down current because if the current picks up speed, well, it could possibly change direction, but at least you can get back to the boat okay. Then, you know what I mean? If right, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, if you're, and if you're really close to shore too, you know, I mean, sometimes we still, you know, we'll, 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 we'll still bend the rules a little bit depending on mm. the situation, but. Mm. Nah, not not that far offshore anymore for me. It's yeah, actually, right. actually, oh, sorry. actually now we've kind of we've kind of on the boat we we were diving off of now we've uh, 
I think we've got what, like a 25 pound anchor. Oh, it's brutal. With, with about it doesn't move. 10 meters of chain. Yeah. It takes two people to deploy the anchor and three people mm. to retrieve it. Yeah. Um, you only have to do it once and you know for sure um, it's not going anywhere. Yeah. In fact, we've even anchored without scope because the anchor is so overkill and ridiculous. Yeah, our anchor doesn't, um, pull. Our anchor doesn't pull anymore. <laughs> yeah. Our anchor doesn't pull anymore. It's one of the things we've learned. <laughs> I was chatting with a guy a while ago and he was saying like you want double your hull length and, and chain and then I think, and then I can't remember what is the rest of his rules were, but that was the one that sort of stuck with me. Um, but 10 meters, I, I mean, that's a fair wad of, of thick chain. So that's got to give you some, some, some uh, confidence. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we probably have a full boat length um, in chain, but we went, yeah, we went thick. You know, I think, what was it, like the fence it's or something thick. like that? Yeah. It's obnoxious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, good stuff. And um, with the Fiji experience, did you have any, any sort of takeaways from that that you'd do differently in the, in the future? Yeah, I started looking at who I was diving with um, and, and, and what their background would be. Um, what their relationship was to me, if they knew who my immediate family members were. Uh, it definitely shed some light on taking who your dive buddy was just a bit more serious and just, you know, instead of just jumping on a boat with somebody sort of random, you know, he was a nice fella, but, um, you know, him and the boat captain just kind of, just kind of left me out in the middle of the ocean. So, mm. yeah, just get to know those folks a bit more what the plan is. Um, <laughs> yeah. trust, trust plays a big part of, of a good um, buddy relationship, doesn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Dive of people you like. <laughs> yeah. The problem is, is though, sometimes I like people, but I wouldn't trust them with my life. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm like, yeah, you're a good, you're a good dude, man, but I'm not going diving with you. No, it's valid. Good point. We good know point. those people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like um, some of my mates, you know, you you're on the boat and you've got the solid plan. Like, yeah, no worries. Um. We'll, we'll head in that direction. Um, you dive first, and then when you come up, just follow me, and then I'll dive next, and you know, and we'll just go like that. And you know, he dives, and then you, you he comes up to the surface, and you go up to him, and then all right, my turn, and then you dive and come up, and he's 150 meters away, you know, or whatever it is, you know. It's uh, <laughs> it's pretty classic and, and spearing, and I mean, yeah. some. some yeah. So sometimes um, that might be the way you agree to dive, but I think if you set a plan, you've got to you've got to try and stick to it. Yeah, we do we we do pretty good. Everybody on the boat, nobody's you know uh, too competitive. You know, out of our out of our little crew that we have, we get a good you know little rotation that we get figured out. So and everybody John, gets John's you know, first dive at a there. spot. <laughs> <laughs> John's just agreeing with you there. He's in the back, just shaking his head. Yeah, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> nah, he wasn't. <laughs> yeah, like as long as you have a, have an understanding with your crew, I think that's a big part of it, isn't it? So yeah. Um. All right, guys, let's get into Veterans Vault. So obviously, you own a, a spearfishing shop there in the in the Panhandle, and you deal with uh, a lot of guys sort of all the way along that sort of stretch of coastline. Um. What are the equipment sort of recommendations that you guys give to people coming in? Do you like to sell pipe guns? Let's start with spear guns because it's a religion question. Do you guys like yeah. to sell the classic big American timber guns or have you guys um, gone the roller route? What, what's, what's, what's the deal? Yeah, you know, um, we, we have them. Um, I mean, if you, if you look on the wall right now, there are some big wood timber guns. You know, there are some sleek you know, carbon, little carbon fiber guns. There's some Euro aluminum rail guns. There's some roller guns up there. We, um, you know, most, most people here are, are just, um, they're, they're, they're spear fishermen, you know, they're not the underwater target shooters and things like that. So it's not ro ro roller guns. I don't, I don't really think are, you know, have caught on here like they have yeah. in some other places. They don't, you know, people just want to get it done. So mm. we don't, we don't really recommend those. Um, especially mm. people starting out, you know, mm. um, and, you know, it's, it's just, we, we think they're really for people who just want to, that want to play with their gear, want to dial in their own gear, have the time to get in the water and, you know, shoot, you know, shoot targets and really figure them out and get used mm. to them. You know, mm. once you, you throw them in a chaotic situation, bait bus on the surface, fish swimming up to you and you, and you have eight bands you have to load on this, you know, 90 centimeter <laughs> carbon <laughs> gun. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it can, yeah, it can throw a curveball at you. Yeah, I uh, agree. usually here in our area, like 110, 120 centimeter gun, you know, it's pro probably gets 90% of everything done around here. Yeah, okay, cool. 
All right. And um, what do you do though when guys come into the shop and they want to spend a hundred dollars on a spear gun and that's it? Um, yeah, it's, we, yeah, we get, we, that's part of our job is we give them that, that dose of reality. You know, we mm. just tell them that it doesn't exist. Mm. Mm. You know, it look, doesn't look exist. Craig's, I mean, look, look on there, Craigslist. No, no, not, not, not the right, not, not one that's going to last longer than just that one dive. Mm. There's an ethical component too, I think. Like if you, you know, the, the really crappy mass produced guns that with, with poor sort of component components, they, they wounded more fish than, than they, they kill. And, um, and they're just awful. They just they don't give people a good experience spearfishing. I, I really struggle with the idea of selling people a, a, a no. spear gun that I know is not going to do the job. We don't we don't even have them in the store. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I could probably sell a lot of them, but I, I don't want to do. Them. I I mean, we, we're spearfishing. You know, we mm. like to get out and kill fish. We want people to actually be successful, and mm. you're not going to be as successful with you know with if if you're you know if you're if you're cutting a lot of corners. And, mm -hmm. and like you're saying, if you, if you're, if you, if the gun isn't suitable for, you know, the actual, like the good fishery that we have here, mm -hmm. you, know, you can't, you can't spend a hundred dollars on a gun and expect to shoot, you know, 20 pound red snap. Mm -hmm. So you guys are liking simple setups um, and relatively short lengths. You were saying 110, 120 is kind of, kind of it. That, that gets it done. Yeah. Our, yeah. our biz isn't like the greatest average viz yeah yeah and i think too that we some of our diving um does require a little bit more of a challenging path um you know 15 meters and beyond so carrying the big american classic wood four band you know urgh, type of gun yeah. um, where you are doing a little bit more of the carbon or aluminum rear handle easier more it's just easier to try and get those depths for anybody you know mm. uh, even the experienced diver so I, th I think that's sort of the way that we're um we're going. I mean, the big American wood gun has its its place, and I'm not saying we don't have them or use them, but yeah, mm -hmm. for sure for the daily for the daily use, um, mm -hmm. European, you know, just pipe guns, rail guns, you know, old school, um, simple. Keep it I simple. Actually, <laughs> I actually, I wasn't shit staring you guys. I, I quite like the wooden platform. Um, I went and tested a whole bunch of guns recently. Um, I got them with three pipe guns and one timber gun, and I fired all my pipe guns first. I had a double roller with 16 mil bands i had a um what else did I, have? I had a salvamar hero uh, 105 and i had a a, a gun an aim right um oh no sorry a, another uh, oh, what's the a pathos pathos laser one one yeah. one yeah. 1.3 um roller as well with a kicker and um, with a breakaway setup because I was going to hunt um a big yellowtail and uh I fired all three of those guns and they were all okay and then I, I got out this big timber gun and it shot p pinpoint um, first yeah. time I pulled the trigger. And like one thing I want with my spear gun is just confidence. And um, like if I pull the trigger, I want to know where, you know, where, where the bloody thing's going. And um, it's so subjective spearfishing aiming. It's not like a bloody, we're not marks, but like you were saying before, it's like we don't get in a pool and do target shooting most of the time. We just want to shoot fish. Yeah, yeah, it almost needs to be an extension of your body, you know, mm. and whatever that gun happens to be, whether it's wood, pipe, mm. aluminum, fiberglass, whatever. I mean, geez, you know, whatever you can do that's more intuitive for you and that makes the shooting easier, you know, that, that's the right gun for you, you know. Yeah, and there's some certain qualities that those big, that, you know, heavier wood guns just have that you just can't, you can't replicate, you know, with yeah. a, you know, real light aluminum gun. You know, they mm. just can't, you know, they, those things just eat up that recoil um, mm. and, you know, help with your accuracy. They just, they do, it does, they definitely have their place. Yeah, cool. All right, what about wetsuits? So you were saying like maybe summertime you're getting down to 1.5 mil, that sounds Oh, that I can't, good. that's like, I, I look forward to 1.5 season more than I look <laughs> forward to any fish opener out there. Yeah, right now we're, we're still in three mil and I don't even know what to do with myself when I'm putting that three mil on. I'm, I'm a yeah. little bit of a fair weather diver now. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm excited. Two more weeks, I think, will be lesson out the one fives yeah so winter time diving is a three mil or are you going five mil oh uh, it depends on on uh, how comfortable you want to be and how long you breathe up on the surface right um mm. so you can get away with three mil you're going to be a lot more comfortable with the five mm. so that's probably here our our winter temp is about you know low 60s to upper 60s um so to, you know for for if you if you have a lot of exposure to it you can get used to the three mil if you're new to it um, for sure, you're going to be a lot toastier in that five. But mm. 
as we all know, diving with a five mil, um, it's it's not quite the same, right? That's like it's like a straight jacket. It feels yeah. like for us here in yeah, Florida. For us, yeah. we're not we're not we're not used to that. You know, that's, that's standard <laughs> yeah. a lot of other places, but to us, that's pretty that's pretty extreme. Yeah, that's it. Does feel more restrictive when you're used to you know three mil or or, or thinner. So yeah, um, have you guys got your own in store brand? Like yeah, we have a, we have brands. we do. We're right now. It's you know it's fins. We've we've done benthic wetsuits. We just kind of sort of we'll do we'll do one item you know here and there. And, yeah. Um. Yeah. Just kind of do do one thing really really well for you know a limited run, and then move on to something else for a limited yeah. run, and just kind of cycle through. Cool. Through item. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. All right. What um what what's um what's a piece of equipment that you've taken a really good look at and um had a go at doing it better. I, I, if I could uh, touch on that would be mm -hmm. Mike with, um, we, we don't really shoot mono ever. In fact, I'm looking around the shop right now and I think we have one skein of 400 pound mono. Um, just some experience with some bigger yellow fin tuna in Mexico. Uh, the boat captain that would take us would just yell at us for bringing mono. He says, you Americans come down here with your big wood guns, your big shafts, your big floats, your big lines. And you got this tiny little piece of metal that's holding this tiny little piece of plastic together. And he goes, you Americans should know better. You should tie knots in a fabric. So mm. as soon as we tell Mike that, I show Mike that, and Mike's just powered the planet looking for um, um, something that'll shoot like mono, but kind of works like the Dyneema. And um, yeah, here at Benthic, we, we, mono is like, a, it's a bad word. It's almost like a four letter word. We shoot, yeah. we shoot um, basically I, I, a Dyneema. Pro yeah. yeah, probably. Man, I would say it's probably less than 1% now of our divers around our area and or our spear gun sales ever get, you know, re-rigged or, 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 or leave the store with mono on it. It's just, um, mm. yeah, it's, 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 it's just the right stuff for us. You know, shipwrecks, oil rigs, big yeah. fish, it's stronger. You know, it's more abrasion resistant. It doesn't, um, it doesn't have those permanent kinks and bend in it. Um, there is a there is a school of guys that think the same of you. There's a and they're, they're all over the place. So they're here as well. Um, the issue I have with it is um, it doesn't hold memory, and sometimes it seems like when you're dealing with that fish up on the surface or on the bottom, even like you just get that tangle. And um, the, whereas the mono holds its shape, so it's sort of I don't know. It seems easier to manage when you've got a, when you've got a fish on. What do you say to that? I, I would agree with you. I would agree with you. The problem we have with them here is because so much of our fish is done on or near a shipwreck um, yeah. or an oil rig, for that matter, in the northern Gulf. The abrasion, you know, that mono, we would have to almost change it. Gosh, I don't even yeah. know in Louisiana, you might have to change it every oil rig um, yeah. if you shoot two or three fish. Just, yeah, they're going to they're gonna destroy it. it. Yeah, 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 it's it's not even an option. Yeah. And this stiff Dyneema, you know, it's, it's, it has a good, it's, you know, it has a Dyneema sheath and it's also polyurethane embedded. So it has, uh, you know, a bit of memory. Like there's, it's stiffer, it's easier to handle in the water. And that's, that's something we wanted, you know, because that's a good thing about mono. What's the thickness of it? And um, what, what knots are you using and recommending that people tie with it? I've seen a few, you know, different uh, versions. We, big figure eight knots, you know, definitely the strongest. Um, mm -hmm. And then we, we have it in one, 1.4, 1.7, and 1.9 millimeter. 1.9 millimeter is definitely the, um, the pick. You know, the, the bulk of what we use. Standard, yeah. yeah we, I mean, we can use it for shooting line, for wishbones, for real line, just kind of, it's, you know, one, one thing that does, does everything. I guess for guys coming off the mono, I mean, we all get used to the, how easy it is to, you know, carrying a pair of crimp, crimping pliers and, you know, dealing with stuff on the boat pretty fast. I guess the, the, the changeover is just getting guys competent and comfortable with the right knots and how to... Yeah, you just got to tie a knot. You don't have extra hardware, you know, on the boat to deal with. There's no mm. crimping. You know, you can just, um, you can pull that same exact line off your reel, you know, mm. and just retie it to your shaft if you need to. It's, it's very convenient to deal with offshore. The figure eight, um, when you shoot a fish and the shaft gets embedded and you can't pull the flopper back through the fish, um, you, you, do you have to cut the line? Uh, no. So we'll we'll uh, we'll have like a quick disconnect slip knot. You know, connecting oh, okay. uh, shooting line to real line or float yep. line, whatever wherever it is. It's um, you know, uh, I learned it initially. I, I it blew my mind mm -hmm. first seeing it in a Rob Allen YouTube video, and I was mm -hmm. just like, 
Is that the? Uh, how, have I, how have I not known about this my entire life? It's just the easiest thing in the world. It has changed. It has yeah. changed my life. Is that the one where you, you twist it around and then you sort of have a, a like a bow in the end, like a shoelace bow, and then yeah, you, yeah, yeah you fold it over, tuck yeah. it halfway through, and pull it tight. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Have you guys got that video on your channel now, or is it, maybe I'll have to link up the Rob Allen one? Yeah, I think it's, it's just the Rob Allen one. I don't want to steal his glory. <laughs> he's got some awesome um, rigging vids, eh? Like, and he's just so um, dry with it. Like, it's it's fun, they're funny to watch. But if you like yeah. want to solve a specific problem, it's like, okay, Rob Allen, you know? Yeah, yeah, I that knot solve solves solved a lot of our problems. Oh just like you're saying, yeah, yeah, just the pulling the fabric through past that big bulky knot. You don't have yeah. clips banging against no. your gun, making noise anymore. You know, your nice, beautiful, you know, carbon and, and timber guns aren't getting scratched and scuffed up by all that extra that metal hardware. You know, you have less potential points of failure and tangle hazards. It's just, yeah, it's a game changer. Okay, cool. All right. What about, um, okay, so you got a fish up at the service with the line management with Dyneema. Um, have you guys developed any tricks for, de for dealing with that? Uh, I think... I mean, just keep kicking, right? Keep keep kicking forward. It's like kind of like you're pulling up float lines so you don't get get tangled in it. Yeah. You know? So keep, make sure keep that moving. Right. Don't yeah. Don't build a big bird's nest around you. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Okay. Cool. 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 So um, everyone's a lot of guys are diving um, with reels there. Obviously, with the yeah, yeah, reels. Yeah. Reels and float float lines less common, but definitely yeah. crucial for some of the deeper, you know, bigger amberjack and things like that. So guys that come in the shop um, that are new to it, what's the recommendation? Um, reels or float lines, rig lines? Well, you know, we tell them, that, you know, this is the safest way to do, you know, to, 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 you know, to go, but this is, you know, here, this is my gun, you know, this is what I do. And, uh, you know, more uh, reels, reels are definitely the more popular. Mm. And, and that's usually for most guys that are just diving, you know, starting out 50, 60 feet, you know, hunt and snapper, then that's, that's, you know, that's sufficient. Mm -hmm. So how much, um, how much line and what size sort of reel are you, are you, what is your go-to? Like the classic, like 50 meter reels, capacity reels. Yeah. Yeah. And that's with the 1.9 uh, millimeter Dyneema on it. Okay, cool. Yeah. And um, brand preference for the Dyneema, what's the, uh, what's your guys' favorite? Well, you said band preference? Brand. No, no. Brand. No, brand for the Dyneema, the shooting line. You're oh, it's, about it, it's uh, well, it's actually, so it's a material, you know, that, um, that I had manufactured. Um, um, it's now, it's, it's, uh, it's Aussie, Aussie reel. Um, ah, nice. Dyneema, yeah. So, ah, okay, all right, cool. Cool. So are you, do you, do you, are you uh, an agent for Aussie reels over there? No, no, not at all. Ah. Not at all. Ah, okay, cool. I didn't realize. It just, it just made more sense. <laughs> they, um, you know, they can sell more line and it's okay. Yeah, yeah. It's okay yeah, with yeah. me. Yeah. Cool. Cool. How much, what, what's the sort of, um, going rate for, for that stuff? I know probably retail price is different everywhere in the world, but can you give me an idea of how, what quantity it gets sold in and how you buy it? Um, I, so I sell it by the foot. Um, hmm. the 1.9, I think it's 34 cents a foot now. So, you know, you look at like a 50 meter spool, you're looking at fifty bucks. Yeah. 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 Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, it's still right. affordable. There's some other Dyneema out there that's, you know, double the price and it gets gets a little crazy, but this stuff, you know, this stuff's worth it. It's worth its weight in gold. Yeah, awesome. No, it's good to, like, I, I know a lot of a lot of equipment's subjective, so you can get a bit wary about saying, well, this is what I recommend because sometimes people take you to task about it, but I think it's worth um, having the chat sometimes anyway, so. Oh, yeah, cool. well, and it is, you know, Spearfit is so, it's su such a personal, you know, uh, experience and activity. I mean, you know, we'll tell people what we recommend, but, you know, and, and let them know, like, but, but hey, you'll figure it out. You know, you'll figure out what you like, you know, eventually mm -hmm. and what you're comfortable with. So, hey, what works for me might not work for anybody else. Yeah, cool. So, question for Joe. Um, with the real guns, prevalence of real guns, uh, there's some specific, uh, is there some specific advice you give guys? uh using them around safety and stuff yeah that's the tensioner making sure your tensioner is set correctly um obviously too loose you get spooled and too tight you get that binding um for us here because our fish you know we're, we're fortunate we have bigger fish 20 plus pound red snapper 
40 plus pound, uh, you know, Kobe is and the bigger AJs, they do come by sometimes when you're not prepared and you still shoot it with the reel without the float line. Um, that tensioner setting, it's everything. Um, mm. it'll, it'll, it could cost you. And that's about, you know, 400 yeah. bucks us for a new oh, gun, yeah. new shaft and a new, um, cause you're going to end up letting go. So, mm. so yeah, the tensioner is everything. Just setting it absolutely perfect. Mm. Um, makes a world of difference. I guess the other thing with using a real gun is you have to be prepared to let the thing go. Yeah, yeah. Don't yeah. be too married to that gun. Yeah, it's, just, <laughs> it's just equipment. You know, if you have to, you let it go. You have a local shop. You can, you can come right back. You can get another gun. It's not, we, we it's can not buy, the end of the world. I always look at it as I can buy a new gun, but I can't buy a new mic. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the thing, the place where I've come unstuck with my real guns is um, how I run the line. So running it out underneath the... Uh, the, the keeper at the at the um the front of the gun, you know, like rather than letting it spool straight off the reel, do you know what I mean? Yeah, using yeah. using the line guide because I, I just yep. yeah I think I read yeah, I like, it and I just forgot we, about we it. We like to use we like to use the line guides. Yeah, in, unless guys are trying to just have one shaft, one line set up to be able to transition between um, using their reel and and making it a breakaway. Yeah, you know, that that's that that would be the time where you wouldn't be able to use the line guide. But um, it, every other time we we use the line guide. It, yeah. I think it helps it helps keep the line up high. It doesn't mm -hmm. give it um, you know leverage to pull and dig down into. The top. Yeah, good point. Yeah, and it, it runs smoother yeah. off because it's going in the same direction. Yeah. And the I think the way the 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 um the line guide acts as a little bit of a. Of, I don't know, maybe like a fulcrum, so that the the tension is consistent rather than yeah, like the hard right. jerks and yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, spot on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've I've nearly nearly got myself in trouble a few times, and I don't run a belt reel. Um, do you guys? What do you? What do you, What's your opinion on belt reels? Uh for the more experienced guys, okay. I think. Yeah. Yeah, just be prepared that it's disposable. You know, again, yeah. if you have to, if it, if it tangles and you don't have that tension or set right, mm. just just you know, you got to ditch the weight belt. You got to ditch the uh, belt yeah. You know, and, and, and we like that Neton, Netonics, um, Netonics belt reel bracket is uh, is an amazing piece of equipment. They did a great job with that. It's real simple, but it's um it's easy to be easy to ditch just your belt reel. Cool. Yeah, yeah you can grab it, tug on it, a little bungee releases, and um, you know. It's a safer way to dive with them. But yeah, I've, I've, I've almost had to give my gun away a couple times to yeah. some bigger amber jack, you know, just on, you know, with the reel on the gun. And I've ditched a belt reel before. Oh. I've ditched the Neptonics one. Yeah. yeah. Jeep is not the expensive Neptonics one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, by the time this episode goes live, um, I've chatted with Jerry Guerra just recently. So I've become a bit more familiar with the Neptonics stuff, I think, for DIY spear gun guys like, um, a lot of their componentry is um, pretty cool. Oh yeah, they they kill that game. They're they're amazing at it. Yeah, their they're float great. line clutch. I wish I had that when I was a younger man. That would have saved me a lot of fish oh and a gosh. lot of energy. That thing is. Uh, <laughs> as soon as they came out with that, I was just cursing myself. Going, you got to be kidding. How simple is this? It's it's Chinese finger torture. Like what a what a joke. And, yeah, it's amazing. Those guys have their stuff together for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, you, you guys, um, you run the shop. Um, you deal with gear day in day out um do you do you get fatigued um just looking and talking spearfishing gear all day because it's your bread and butter uh no i don't know not really you know i, I like the gear i I, yeah, I can geek out on that stuff all day mm. that's still fun you know mm. um i i get maybe maybe what fatigues me a little bit is maybe if it, if it keeps me on keep me on keeps me on dry land for too long you know if it, yeah, if yeah. It, if it keeps me from diving then yeah, that can that can take its toll. I'll go one of those. It's, it, there's a definitely a you know, really important you know <laughs> work dive balance that I've you know I've got to figure out. Yeah, right, cool. All right, Joe. Um, like we've 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 gone right into gear, which is fantastic. Another big passion of yours is teaching people to free dive. Um, I'd love to sort of dial in on maybe the one or two things that you consistently see, um, you know as being major sort of safety concerns with, with guys that you're teaching um, to free dive spearfish? Yeah, one of the things I've noticed, um, if, if there was just one thing, is that everyone seems to do really well with diving with a buddy in a class. And then um, I see the folks, or I'll join folks, students later on a boat spearfishing. And um, for some reason, when the, just the training float goes away 
um, and everyone's pushing themselves for some reason when they're spear fishing, they kind of start to slack on the buddy stuff. And, um, you know, there's really just no place for that in spear fishing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I used to dive that way and now some of the stuff that we're doing in low visibility, you know, deeper dives, you know, 30 meter dives in low visibility with a real gun. Um, you know, your, your buddy has to be spot on. He has to be there. He or she has to be there when you come up. Mm. Um, you know, you're starting to push that, push that envelope a little bit. So, you know, I don't yell at anybody or get on them. I mean, I'm not the dive police, but, um, you know, you have to be careful with that stuff. Or it's mm. supposed to be fun and it's just too easy to keep it safe, you know. So mm. why, why do that is kind of what I try and, you know, push on the folks is uh, you got to have a buddy. It's just, um, besides you're not landing a big fish by yourself anyway. You know, realistically, you need somebody on the boat yeah. to yell back to. You know, I mean, hold my gun, do this, do that. Like, and it's just more fun that way anyway, you know, mm-hmm. so. Mm-hmm. So what's, uh, what are the, what's the sort of the practical steps um, you give to these guys to get them to adhere to a buddy practice? Um, gosh, steps, you know, sometimes I war story them, I guess. Yeah. Sometimes I tell yeah. them some of the stuff <laughs> that I've seen in the water. Mm. um and it starts to you know the i I think finality is a reality you know when Mm. you start to give people some of the things you've seen um some of the worst free dives i've ever had to do are at work when i'm looking for a body on the bottom you know i don't want to be debbie downer during the interview but there is a drowning is a certain there's a finality to it um and i've actually i've actually done it to people that i've known that were free diving for just sand dollars and shells someone that i knew um, we had to go look for them and we didn't find them until a day later. So, you know, there's a reality to that. And, um, um, you know, why, why go through that? Why this thing is supposed to be fun, not morbid and sad. So, mm. so anything you do to keep it that way is, is kind of important. Mm-hmm. One thing, um, I had Ted Hardy on from Immersion Freediving several times. And, like, I think the stories and, and stuff are fantastic. They, they definitely inspire people to, to think about these things. Um, I guess the... the the, the other part of it is that the guys seem to lack a roadmap for how to do it. It's like they start off with the intention to buddy up, but they don't. And Ted laid out this thing just based on the scuba diver thing. He's like, all right, um, you jump in the boat. One's designated the leader. He, he dives. And then when he's returned to the service, you, you know, you check on him, give him that 15, 10, 15 seconds grace just to make sure he's all good. And if, if you have any doubts, then you wait any longer. Um, and then, you know, you're then the leader, you know what I mean? And then the other dude just follows you. And Just having that clear distinction of like, okay, when I'm on the bottom, you're following me. And then when I'm, you know, when I'm, when, when you're about to dive, I'm following you, you know, just that clear sort of distinction, like that's your job. Yeah, well, yeah. one up, one down, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and, and some of the shitty biz that we dive in, that's how you're not going to get yourself shot, right? Like, mm-hmm. I mean, if you put two people on the bottom where, where we're diving, you can get, you make a shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty murky. Mm. I guess the other yeah. com- the other complaint that people have is like with buddy diving is particularly when you're hunting spooky species is uh, one diver you can get away with, two divers, particularly in, in sort of shallower water, um, the noise just destroys any chance you have of getting a clean approach. Yeah, so, have- so we have, a, yeah, a solution for that is to just be a t- to sort of triangulate, you know, especially if it's shallow enough. So, so, if that diver goes down 30, 40 meters ahead of you, you mm. just kind of sit back. And you, if, you, if you're diving with the same people uh, long enough, or even with someone who's new, past one or two dives, you kind of know their dive pro- profile. Mm. You know if they're a 30 second breath hold, you know if they're a two minute breath hold. And you just kind of look at your watch and when, when they start to come up or when you anticipate them starting to come up, you just start to close the distance. And you know, if you get a little bit of practice on that, you're right on top of them and everything's okay. It's not, it's not that hard. I know people try and make it like it's, it's a difficult thing to do, but it isn't. Mm. Mm. It, it might have an impact sometimes, but you know, we, we definitely, I, I think we, we believe and we, we attribute some of our success spear fishing with the fact that, you know, it's a team event that he's, he's there to put the second shot in the fish that he's, you know, it's, uh, you know, it, we're, we're more successful when we're, when we're buddy diving. Correct. Yeah. You have, you have more time in the water. You know, more people are more, you know, more, more, more bottom time is covered. And, uh, you know, we feel like we see and shoot more fish than if we were, if we were mm. competitive. I've come up to the surface and, um, you know, my reel screaming out and, um, you know, it's em- quickly emptying of line. And then, you know, I'm starting to get towed in the water behind this thing and I'm looking around and there's just no one there, you know, because maybe everyone's got fish on at the same time or whatever. And then you, you know, 
you, <laughs> you finally start to catch up with this fish and you realize your shaft's just hanging in the fish and you're like, shit, where's my buddy? You know, like I could really do with a second gun right about now. And um, the other part of I, I really love with, with diving with good people is it's like um, you just relax so much more. Like if you know your buddy's got your back, then you, you know, I don't know, I get down on the bottom, I'm even deeper than I'm normally comfortable and I, and I just start to, I feel, I feel comfortable, you know, I know he's going to be there when I get back up and that makes yeah, it. Yeah, you're going to make, you're going to make a better dive too, right? Yeah. You're, you're gonna, yeah, yeah. 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 It just lowers the old heart rate um, because there's a lot of stuff in spearfishing that, you know, I mean, we all get taught to relax, but it's like, sometimes you get these compounding things that cause you anxiety, you know, like whether it's sharks, dirty water, cold water, boat traffic, um, a shit buddy, uh, all of these things. And sometimes it's like, you know, you're trying to get your heart rate down and just relax and have a good day. And it's like, I'm, I'm dealing with so much stuff in the back of my mind. I, I can't get the clarity I need in order to relax. Um, I mean, that's a big part of learning spear. And I guess is getting people to manage that anxiety. Um, have yeah, you guys, one of the reasons why a lot of people get into it too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's that, that constant edginess. Like, it, it gives you the buzz, the, the flow state. Yeah, yeah we, we, we sort of develop a, uh, you know, a natural, we naturally figure out a little rotation on the boat, too, because we're, we're usually diving these tiny little reefs. So we have to dive a lot of them. So we'll figure out this rotation. Hmm. You know, Joe goes first on this one. Um, the next spot, I go first. So there's no stress. You know, the, the guy who's going first can take his time. He's not rushing to get his fins on, you know, get in the water first and, you know, rushing to breathe up, you know, really quickly to, to beat me to get the first dive in. So it's a, it's a lot easier for us to, you know, to relax. That's what we figured out. It's good for us at least. Yeah, cool. So you guys run courses out of the shop there? Yeah, we sure do. All right. Tell me about um, how often that sort of happens. Yeah, so right now we run a level one free dive course um, yeah. to 20 meters. We do, we're do we doing one of those right now almost every single weekend. Uh, oh. We also offer the level two to uh, 40 meters, 132 feet. And then we have some specialty courses that we do um, from time to time, spearfishing specific. We are a spearfishing shop. Mm -hmm. um, we do waterman survival extended. We have a large military base here um, right next door to us, Eglin Air Force Base. So we have all different branches of the U.S. military coming in, Navy, Air Force. Uh, actually, we've never had Marines, but Army. Um, and we have a lot of those guys coming in here. And um, they might not be interested in spearfishing when they walk in. They are when they come out. But those guys have a lot, of, and girls, have a lot of tests that they have to go through that are involved in the water. And they, um, it's funny that our military doesn't teach you how to hold your breath, but they'll test you on how to hold your breath, you know. So... <laughs> It's kind of crazy, and uh, we've had a lot of success working with those with those groups in the military and getting them um, extremely proficient in their breath hold. Mm. Yeah, wicked, awesome. Well, that's that's good. People have got um, a resource in that part of the world. Um, Stephen, uh, who helps me with the podcast a little bit, he actually hooked me up with you guys, and he's military as well. So um, yeah, it's very interesting in that part of the world. I think um, with PTSD as well. Um, you know, some of these guys returning from war and that do you, do you, do you feel, find a lot of veterans um, really enjoy, you know, the mental health aspect of spearfishing? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We've, we've had quite a few guys that have, you know, um, that that's been one of their, one of their primary reasons for starting you now is to kind of deal with some of the issues they're working through. And it's, you know, there's so, some guys at least it's helped immensely, you know, there's been a few guys that, you know, thinks it saved their lives. Um, giving them something to do and something uh a way to relax you know and uh it's, you know, it's, i mean we we know you know it's one of the healthy healthiest things you can do outdoors so. mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's seems to be awesome for um your sympathetic nervous system you know like just um like i think this stuff happens uh, maybe it's a, i don't know if it's just a, a guy no i don't think it's just a guy thing but it's like we have this stress creep up in the back the back side of our lives and we're not even really aware of that low-lying hum I think sometimes this, the, you know, spearfishing acts is a little bit like mindfulness and some of these other sort of maybe more viewed as woo-woo type ideas, but it's kind of like a, a way we enjoy doing this. And then it, that's, I think it helps deal with that stuff. Um, is that something you guys sort of encounter or agree with or think about? Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. All that's, all that stuff disappears when we're underwater, right? The mortgages, the, mm -hmm. the wives, the kids, the dogs, the, the nine to five job. If, yeah. if you have another one besides just teaching the dive classes and yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. The mindfulness. I mean, can't remember who said it, but you know, free diving, spear fishing is probably 90% in your head and the rest is mental, right? Like if you can just get down there and relax and that's kind of the key. <laughs> yeah, no, that's cool. All right. What about funny moments out in the water? Um, you guys seem like you'd, you'd be good fun to go diving with. Surely some, uh, some funny <laughs> shit happens out of the water. That was real easy to get spun up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, oh. my funniest moment was um, actually did happen in Australia. Um, I was <clears> drinking <throat> with some lifeguard supervisors. And um, they asked. I always was spearfishing and giving them some of my catch. And uh, if you're familiar with red morong, you know, it's kind of a weed eater and it's not the best to eat. And they asked if I could shoot some silver brim. It's a little bit better eating. They said, why don't you give us that? So I said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that tomorrow. And I woke up and I had a little bit of the beer shits uh, out on the, on the headland there. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's right next to, I was at Bogolda Beach and the beach next door was Newport Beach. I think that's where Tommy and Nick Carroll might have grew up. But anyway, it's like it's a heavy localism kind of surfing group and the boys were out surfing the point and i had to shit and uh i was like oh, i'll just drop my weight belt and i'm thinking how can i go and get it this deep at 50 meters with you know five mil top five mil bottom i said ah fuck it i'll just shit my wetsuit and uh um, <laughs> yeah just shit in a brand new like uh yeah 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 it's pretty bad and um so i'm just watching like these little sweeper kind of eating like the like the little bits off my legs and i shoot some <laughs> So I'm like, oh, I'll shoot some silver brim. I'm like, man, I really feel a lot better. So I swim back. I'm kind of running a bit late for work. And if you're familiar with the northern beaches, they have those uh, saltwater rock pools at the end of the headlands. Yep. So I'm kind of worried, like, if all the moms and stuff like that are out there with the kids swimming and stuff. And I've never shit in a wetsuit. I'm thinking, do I have a stain on the back? Like, how bad is this? <laughs> I, run, I run into the surf club. And sure enough, one of my supervisors in, is in there. And um, he's like, you're late. You're late. You're late. Thank you. And he comes around the corner. I'm in the shower. I've got all the fish. He comes around the corner. He starts sniffing. He goes, you <laughs> dirty seppo. You dirty seppo. Did you shit your wetsuit? And I turn around. I said, yeah, yeah, Phil. I, I shit my wetsuit. What do you want me to say? So as a, as a new American lifeguard on the northern beaches, my phone and my lifeguard station never rang. I must have got calls all the way up to like, like up coast that day because, uh, yeah, yeah. I was known as the Yankee who shot his wetsuit. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a legacy what a legacy yeah great it's great that's my that's what i left in sydney yeah so you saw this part of the show and you were just like yes i've got a good shit story <laughs> yeah it's a bit embarrassing yeah, yeah. Uh, i love a good no, shit story it's all, we Fantastic. have a good time when we're diving there's all kinds of good funny moments out there it's uh yeah it's, that's one of my main reasons why i dive we got some good dive buddies we have good times me too. I think um, if they if they if they keep diving with you, then the fun just gets more and more bizarre. I think it's harder to explain to others outside your group as well. But uh, yeah. Um, what about your your dive bag, Mike? What are you? What's when you go diving? What are you? What's your? What 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 are you using? Uh, so gear, my my little kit that I got together right now. Mm -hmm. Oh man, right now. Um, Right now, right now, I'm using a just a you know good old silicone simple cheap black snorkel. Yep. Um, don't I don't know if I'll ever use anything other than that. Um, yeah. I'm using a Salvamar mask. Yep. A benthic wetsuit. Okay. I'm rocking the you know Garmin. Oh, thanks for the beard, Joe. No. Uh, Garmin computer. Uh, let's see. I, I've 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 really started to like the silicone um, weight belts. I just transitioned over those, um, so I'm, I'm I got a new new silicone uh, belt that that C4 just came out with recently. Um, I really like that thing. Filled what did you really have well before? Um, just a latex. You know your typical mm -hmm. latex Marte belt. Um, mm. is what you know is my my go-to. Um, so what's the advantage not, over the new one? You know, I, I, you know, I just, I, 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 I wasn't a fan in the past of some of the silicone belts that I, that I, you know, I'd seen and felt and handled. And um, these ones just, it have um, just kind of the right, their, their thickness is good. There's a good, you know, it's a nice thick belt and um, it, it's, it's not flimsy, you know, it's not too stretchy. Um, is it a right mile? And it seems Ma like it hold, it's held up really well. It's been really durable for me. Um, Ma much buckle? more than a typical latex. Is it the yeah, Marseille Ma buckle? Marseille. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I, I, yeah Marseille. Um, cool. 
All what right. I've gotten used to. That's that's what most guys in our area, um, you know, really are really wearing. You know, it's 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 strange. You know, talking to other shop owners and stuff like that all over the place. It's you know, other places, you know, I'll, I'll talk, I talked to one guy and he's like, man, that's crazy. He's like, nobody wears those things here. Everybody mm. uses the, you know, the, the quick detached ones. Mm. But, but the, uh, the, the quick detached ones, the, the quick detached ones can catch like, um, depending on how thick the, the belt is like, like even they have to be fully locked up in the 90 degree position in order to release. If it's like at a 45 degree angle, either forwards or backwards, sometimes they won't, won't even release it. It's kind of like not even a quick release. Whereas the Marseille, if you pull it, it, there's only one way it's going. Yeah, I don't like to hate on any piece of gear too mm. much because right yeah. to each their own. But yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I don't trust them. I don't trust them and I don't sell a lot of them because of it. Mm. Yeah, I, I look at that Marseille belt. It's like I've been wearing a belt on my pants since I was eight years old. It's a pretty simple mechanism to fasten and unfasten. So even if yeah. the shit hits the fan, right, it's a, it's a belt. It's not some sort of, you know, complex... <laughs> Mm. complex mechanism to, to detach you know so mm. what do you guys think of the um the the g-string that some people use with a belt like so some people even say like with a rubber belt or uh that, that they'll still ride up or like when they duck dive and yeah. stuff like that so they'll run a string line underneath and sometimes the a, string line serves there's, other a, there's a product you know the company has and um I, man i think i've had I think I've had those in the store for seven years and maybe I've sold <laughs> one of them in seven years. Yeah. Man, I'm helping you to sell a few now. Wait till yeah, you yeah, we got them. We got extras. Man. We got a special deal on them. Anybody yeah. needs one, give me a call. The covered in dust, fellas, but um, you're welcome. To yeah. uh, cool. Um, what about, uh, so, you, oh, sorry, your wetsuits, the Benthic wetsuits. Um, what, you want to give me a secret sauce on, 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 on what their composition, what they're made out of? Um, yeah, it's it's good Yamamoto material. Um, it's you know uh, Roger Yasbeck is um, is the guy who actually uh, produced them for okay. me, and you know just phenomenal quality. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a good good combination of the the cut the panels, um, the right material, the right fabric, the right gluing, um, you know the the right stitching, and and our the one point five mil suits. You know, in the past have you know have just always been really just not durable. You know, you couldn't couldn't rely on them for more than more than a season probably you know they just get yeah. tore up um um or they were or they were flat lock stitched you know and they would let water in as opposed to being blind stitched you know mm. so it's 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 pretty amazing you know they're um that guy's able to uh, to blue and blind stitch mm. you know 1.5 millimeters mm. you know <laughs> of, of of material that's that's pretty incredible to do that you know consistently mm. so and that's that's been a game changer because that's just Man, you, you still get some thermal protection. You still have the buoyancy. You can still put on a little bit of weight and um, just comfortable. Don't yeah, feel nice. like you're wearing anything. Yeah, you're not restricted or anything. And uh, it definitely helps me dive better. Cool. What about spear guns? What's in your uh, What's in your war, war chest? Uh, man, I, I'm pretty. <laughs> I'm terrible with guns. I can't. I, I don't use one really for two. I, I I feel like I have to try try new things out right yeah like yeah I, yeah i got a burn through, job. you know yeah try new try new guns out so but right now i, I really like these new um uh their blue green blue green falcon carbon guns um, okay that's, I'm, I'm diving a couple of those right now they're real 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 streamlined um you know carbon uh pipe gun a monoblock style yeah. a magnet in the muzzle which is really nice with a real shallow track um mechanism is um you know part of the internal handle frame and it's just been it's just it's i've been impressed so far so are they're they're, they're a great easy. greek manufacturer uh they're greek yeah mm. yeah cool i've seen them they uh what's what's like the i mean it's a rude question maybe but what's the price point on those those bad boys um they're in the mid i think the, the largest one uh the 110 which is which is like a 120 um it's like around 450 dollars okay all right, cool, cool. So for the carbon monoblock, um, you know, world actually very inexpensive, very competitive. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, cool. Um, durability of the carbon so far, what's your initial impressions? Um, some people maybe, you know, uh, not big fans of carbon fiber because of perhaps per perceptions around how robust it is. Um, yeah, just like anything else, right? I mean, you can get 
mm-hmm. get cheap carbon and you can get good carbon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, it's it's um they've all held up pretty well, you know, for for, for me personally. Uh, I, I like it. I like the rigidity of it. Um, you know, I like how you can you can you tend to put a little bit heavier shafts on the carbon guns. They'll float them better. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we like to step up those those you know real thin, lightweight, easy to dive with guns. They can still you know step up into like maybe a 7.5 millimeter shaft and still have a little punch you know a little little extra you, momentum you probably want a 7.5 for the amber jacks like you, you'd uh it's nice you, you might pretzel a seven or a 6.5 mil oh yeah. there, there's nothing in the sixes no. here we don't have anything no. you'd want to shoot with a six yeah, yeah we, they'll pretzel it for sure the only yeah really only thing the smallest we have that we stock at least in the store is seven mil. just around mm. here that's just it's you're not even going to penetrate most fish, you know, at range with, with a sub seven mil. It doesn't have the energy. One thing I'd really like to see in a spearfishing shop is a um, is a banana shaft wall. So just like a massive canvas with um, shafts, just sort of heavy duty we've, glued onto this thing with these pretzel <laughs> shafts. That'd be excellent. We've got a couple in the classroom, actually. <laughs> yeah. We, we, yeah, they're all leaned up against the wall. But you know what I mean? Like, like, a, nice, a nice little display wall. Of yeah, them. yeah, that yeah. Pretty cool. That's a know, good idea. I like it. I like when you it. look at it, when you look yeah. at it, you're just like, you know, there's a story behind every single one of those. That's things. right. Yeah, yeah. Zero art. Yeah, that's a good idea. And it's a really visual, funny representation. And um, and you guys would see a shitload of them, I'd imagine. Oh my gosh! Yeah. We, yeah. They, yeah. They. They. You know, I think I got a good, good, good thing, good idea now. Uh, thank you. We're gonna, I'm not gonna re- throw them all in the dumpster now. <laughs> I reckon a good little ad campaign would be um, trade in your bench shaft. We'll give you five dollars off your new one, and and you you know can go on the wall or whatever. That'd be I like it. That's cool. That's what, great. That's, that's well, great. You can, you can you can count on it. That's official <laughs> policy now. Good idea. Not, I think I might be coming over your guys' way early next year, so maybe it'll be up by then. Oh yeah, man! You got to come five. Yeah, yeah, cool. I'll, get on I'll, the boat. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll definitely look you guys up. That'll be cool. Um, let's do the last last section of the show. Um, Spiro Q and A. So sort of a faster pace around the questions. I might do four questions so you guys can do two each if you want. Yep. Sure. All right. Who's going first? Joe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Joe. What what's something a little bit different that you do that you haven't seen many other Spiros do? Or any. Um, I'm. I oh. <laughs> so you, you can't tell me the shitty wetsuit story. No, no, <laughs> not staining my wetsuit. Um, um. Let me come back to that one if you don't mind. All right. Um, my single best resource for improving your spearfishing. Your local free dive shop. Yeah, for Easy sure. One. It's massive for conditions and network and good, having someone good with equipment oh, yeah. expertise in your corner for sure. Um, Joe. Yes. What is the spearfishing destination you would mo- most like to go to? Fiji. I've been, but I would love to go back. I would love to find someone with a few million dollars to take me out to those pinnacles that are way, way out off of Fiji that no one seems to go and get to dive. Free dive, um, free dive, Fiji Jagger crossing hat. Um, we we've spoken via email. Um, some of the quotes. I understand the places that I want to go, and I understand it is a business. I'm just not quite there yet to to yeah. pull the trigger on it. No pun intended. But uh, at some point, I will. Yeah, yeah. Mm. He's got some amazing access to some amazing uh, uh, potential there for sure. I reckon Benthic could sponsor you for sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm gonna ask the owner. <laughs> uh, Mike, who has been the most influential personal people in your spearfishing journey? Um, yeah, that's that's another easy one. It's this guy right here, Joe. Mm-hmm. Joe, hey. another one of our really good dive buddies, uh, Fred Cardet. Um, you know, an older gentleman with, I mean, unbelievable amount of experience, and that's kind of our, our, our our go-to little little crew you know for a day that's that's uh we, we dive together all the time and those guys have more experience you know combined than i'll ever have all right um joe are you ready to answer my question yeah i think so i think i think i am i think i think what separates me from other spear fishermen um is that the mentality of even though um i certainly haven't been doing it as long as um some folks 25 years i've been doing it is um i've always taken a bit more of a humble approach i see some people take the 
the type A personality. Um, they've been doing it for two or three years. Um, um, I don't know it all. I sure do have a lot of experience. Anytime I go somewhere, um, even locally, I try and pick up as much to learn. Um, and I try to offer as well, but I try to learn. Um, I've learned so much about spearfishing um, with international travel, seeing how people do things just a bit differently, whether it's rigging or attracting of a fish. So, um, you know, I, I, I take a more of an, a humble approach. I'll be the first guy to admit well, that I know a lot, but uh, it's for sure not all of it. That's a fact. Cool. Hey, dudes. Well, I've had a, a fantastic um, interview. I know people can come and check you guys out. Um, Benthic, are you, what's your website? Uh, BenthicOceanSports.com. Okay, cool. And are you guys on all the socials? Yeah, the, you know, the couple that I know about. <laughs> oh man, I was, I was talking to someone. I only the other know day. two of them, and yeah, man, it's yeah, it's it gets kind of crazy. Someone was telling me the other day that I have to get on this other one. I can't even remember what it's called, and I was just like, man, I don't even like doing the ones I do sometimes. <laughs> like, Dude, there's a new one every week. And people yeah. are like, you gotta get on that, and I'm like, oh, I've never heard of it. Yeah, yeah. Nevertheless, I'll link up your guys' show notes. Um, so, if you guys go to um, noobspiro.com forward slash benthic, B E N T H I C, then everything we've chatted about, including the, the shop here, will be linked up. And uh, it'd be great to get a couple of photos of you fellas in there with, your, with, your, uh, with some catches you're proud of, maybe, or some moments that you're proud of when you're spearing. Hell yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely. easy. Mm, cool. And um, any parting sort of bit of advice or guidance for uh for people out there yeah there's no there's no uh there's old divers and bold divers but there's no old bold divers so uh, <laughs> yeah just be careful out there man that's all just, did just you, did, yeah no fish is worth dying for and shop local shop local <laughs> <laughs> i love what you did your there. advice off the internet yeah. <laughs> No, good fellas. Well, um, fantastic chat. I'll, um, we'll have to catch up hopefully next yep. year when I'm yeah. there, right? Eh? Yeah, thanks for yeah, having me. Yeah, when you come over for sure, we'll have you on the boat. Count on right, it. Cool.